We'll talk about clean code and uh, refactoring, okay? So in terms of clean code and refactoring, uh, we've already uh, gone and done a number of the testing types uh, last week. And yesterday we had the uh, project um, customer uh, demonstration and today we'll cover refactoring and then tomorrow we'll just cover uh, fakes. So in terms of the intended learning outcomes, supply clean concepts in order to write code of a high standard, employ refactoring techniques to improve the efficiency and readability of code, and to describe and apply software testing methodology as part of a test suite. Okay, so in terms of pre-reading, um, there is the programming habits you should adopt, which should only take you about five minutes to read, and then uh, there's a pre-quiz that you can do, um, before there'll be quizzes in the actual lecture. So why a uh, clean code? It's easier to start um, and continue. So um, if you get clean code, it means it can be read and then you can more quickly make changes because uh, you're not really doing greenfield. You're more likely to be adding new features to an existing code base. So if it's got clean code, you can understand it a lot easier and therefore it's easier for you to start working on it to add that new feature. So it's easier to follow and understand. Um, so it's better as well for team onboarding. If you have a team that's um, having to look at code, which is all variables are called ABC, um, it's very hard for them to start to understand the application. And a big part of you being in that team is to understand that application well. And the cleaner that code is, the easier it is then for both you and your fellow teammates to go and get onboarded. Most, as I've said, most time is spent enhancing and adding new features. So therefore making that code easy to read is, you also want to try and avoid duplication. And the clean, cleaner your code is, the more likely that someone will understand what it's doing and the more likely it is they can try and then reuse your code. So what you've done can add more value to other parts of the system. A method should only achieve one thing. So you don't want to necessarily be doing too much in a method. So it should either be achieving one thing or it should be a process organizer method. So it calls other methods, okay? You don't want to be doing too much. And likewise, you should probably only be having, if you're achieving one thing, try to only have a maximum of about four to five variables. Or if you're an organizer method, only call about four to five methods. So there's a few articles and references at the back about working, me working memory, but it's the same as true of sort of in presentations. You can only sort of uh, keep in your memory about six things, tops about seven, and some people can only keep about five things in your memory. So by you having 20 variables, it's hard for people to keep track of what the different variables are doing and what they're for. Whereas if you've only got four or five variables, someone's more likely to understand what your method's doing because they can still keep in their memory what those different variables are doing and what they're for or the different methods you've called already. And you just, your working memory would struggle if you're doing more than that. And method and variable names are more should be sort of descriptive um, statements, okay? So you want those method names and variable names to be quite good. And slightly, um, as I've talked about, by having a method name that's quite descriptive, so you've got a very complicated piece of code and maybe you want to add a comment. Well, in actual fact, if you create that line of code just as a separate method, then the method name is describing what it's doing. So avoiding the need for you um, to add a comment, but likewise, by creating that one line of code, although it makes you a bit excessive as a method, if it's a very complicated piece of code, you can then test that individual method very well. So you then have greater confidence that the complicated bit of code works. And your code should almost be readable that you go to the organizer methods and you just know by reading it what it does. And it's normally then camel case the methods and variable names starting in a lowercase letter. And that way you can sort of read it. And I remember actually being in a situation on a, a project in a slightly different language, but it was very much object oriented. And I went and said, oh, someone asked me, what's the validation for uh, these uh, um, 
um, types of bonds. And all I did was look it up and then it just had validation, very easy to find the method. And then it just said, has a fee um, is less than, is more than such and such amount. And it, I basically had four statements and I just copied them and put the spaces between the camel case. And then I just sent it to the person and they were very happy. But it was just the fact is you can get code that's just almost English and you can just read it. And it should be quick to read and not too long. Although um, uh, Robert Martin uh, is sometimes referred to as Uncle Bob, who's got a very good book I refer to at the end for how to write clean code. Uh, and one of the challenges is he suggests having very sort of long name and very descriptive. But the point is, although it's quick to write because of pr the predictive test and you only put in the first word or two words and all they predict the rest of it, you don't want it to be too long. The same token that you can remember four or five um, variables, you can probably only remember three or four words before you start forgetting what the initial words are. So therefore, I would I would slightly contradict uh, Robert Martin and say, don't go overboard in the, what your description, you want it to be quick to read and understand and therefore being overly descriptive in your statements may be slightly counterproductive. Another thing to consider is word shape that we'll just go on um, into next. So um, cognitive processing in reading text, okay, uh, which is what typoglycemia means. So can people read this? So that's it translated and how close did you get to organizing? According to a researcher at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in the word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letters be in the right place and the rest can be a total mess and you can read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole and looks at the shape. So therefore, if you're naming variables that have similar first and last letters and have a similar shape, it will become slightly more um, challenging. Um, so the, the certain things, it is slightly the, the shape that makes the difference. And some of these words are slightly easier because of it. And there was a paper um, that's written that I've referenced that goes into a little bit more detail on that. But just to bear in mind, and this is going to quite the nth degree, but more if you're just aware of it and, and you can do it, you're more likely then to know who the variables are. And likewise, although it's not too much, but if you had one variable called book and another called books, okay, they're different words and they have a different last letter, but they were quite similar and you could get confused. Whereas if you had book and library, you very much know that they're different things, in which case you're less likely um, to make mistakes, okay? So just in terms of that, the first and last letter are quite important and the overall word shape. And I just, with the one and two, if you go to the end slides, I have some references that just talk a little bit more about this, okay? So clean code examples. So for example, if you're a Boolean, rather than calling it a, is found, has been found, whatever. It means then when you're reading the code, it's a lot easier to understand if that's what the objective is. You understand what the variable is doing is to check if something is found. And if it's not found, it's false. If it is found, it's true. But also when you do an if statement, if is found, then. That then makes English sense. If has been found, then. So therefore you're, you're reading the code as though it's English or while is found or while not found or whatever, then you're reading just almost as English or string, first name, last name. Some people are simply tempted, and this is more slightly historically for when you had to type out everything and you didn't have fancy IDEs that protected the text. And slightly if you've got very old, very, very old code, certainly when I was coding in my day last century, um, uh, you to type out everything, so in which case people sometimes try to keep their variable names a little bit shorter, so it would just be FN, LN. But the same token, when you go, that may make sense to you when you're writing it, but when you go back to it, well, what's LN again? It doesn't necessarily obviously make sense, but last name is last name. 
or date date of birth rather than DOB. The acronym can mean any number of things and in the context you might know, but still it just makes it a lot clearer. And things like is valid application. So again, if you've got a while is valid application or if valid application, it almost just reads as English, okay? And method, full name. So it tells you what it's doing. And maybe you have get full name, but you then going in can put a print out full name with grade, whatever. It's a lot easier then to understand. Um, so the refactoring, just repeating some of what I've got is, it's easier to start and continue, it's easier to follow, it's better for team onboarding, and more teams, most time is spent enhancing code and adding new features, and you're avoiding duplication. And it does one thing, it can be reused. So if you're getting very complicated methods that do, or functions that do, three or four things, it's less likely you can quickly take out that one bit that you want to reuse. Whereas if you methods just do the one thing, it's more likely then that your code will be reused and can continue to go on. Um, and if you're the only un person that understands that code base, you're gonna be stuck there and you will um, keep on getting questions. You want to move on and progress and start um, what way you go as a job, you might go slightly more towards the architectural route, you might go, go more towards the team lead, you might be going more towards the mentoring and software engineering expert, but for you to start progressing, you need to move on before that code base. And if you're the only person that can understand the code, you'll be the only person that's maintaining it or you'll be constantly getting questions, which is just then not best use of your time. And what happens when someone's on holiday when no one can really understand the code? Um, and you'll not be able to move on and you'll be stuck. Um, can you hand over this application easily? It would make a lot more sense if it's well refactored and uh, got nice clean code. And the slight thing is the more lines, it's a lot easier to maintain um, an application with uh, 5,000 lines of codes rather than 10,000 lines of codes by refactoring and reusing, you're reducing the amount of code bases, you're also just fixing it then in one place. Okay, so the slight rules of refactoring is your methods and function, again, should do one thing, no duplication, problems can be, might have to be fixed several times. So if you have one class that goes and generates out a spreadsheet rather than having lots of different classes that generate a spreadsheet. If the spreadsheet functionality changes, uh, Microsoft does an upgrade. If say you're using a, an Excel spreadsheet, you can fix it in one place, yeah? Or if someone goes and says, oh, we need to support Microsoft and new startup spreadsheet. Well, the point is you know that all the spreadsheets are generated from this one place. So it's very easy for you to change it so that people can generate different types of spreadsheets. Um, and you want to try and have also a consistency of uh, style, um, making sure that it's easier um, to read in nice clean code. And later tends to be never. So people comment in code um, to add such and such to refactor. It tends to never be done. So it's better if you are going to refactor to do it now. It's also a lot easier for you to refactor now rather than later, because you're now familiar with what the code does, you understand what it does. Because if you go to refactor later on, you need to go up another learning curve to understand how the code works. So it's better to try and always do that. And don't always comment, okay? So um, as I mentioned, one of the problems is in some, I look after internships, and some of them, their companies actually say no commenting allowed. And one of the problems with comments is, but well, the main problem with comments is that people add a comment, then someone is in a rush to do a fix because it's a production issue, it's a hot fix. So they make the fix, then the comment doesn't get changed. So it then creates ambiguity because the comment is different from the code. And what's the point of having a comment if it doesn't explain that code, which is why people are very against it. I'd actually be very cautious of using comments, but I think if you're doing something that is very unusual, for example, you normally would have addressed it using a linked list or some data structure, but you've used another data structure, which isn't obviously suitable, but it's for a particular issue that's been come across, in which case that situation 
should probably have a comment. So I think comments are good, but only in very rare circumstances. Don't comment something you could read. And as I mentioned earlier on, rather than a comment, potentially create that line in a method so the method name describes what the code is to do and that avoids the need for comments. Another way I used to do it is that I potentially had um, exception handling and the comments that would be parsed out to logs. I used that as my comments. So what would be written out to the log is what the problem was. That was actually my comments. So the message that the exception handler would get to display out failed at point such and such would actually be the comment in the line. So I'd create a message above each, potentially above each line. And then if one of the lines failed, then it would say this failed at such and such a line. That's slightly old fashioned though, because in my day, you didn't get, as you get in Java and you get in Python, it's quite exact of where the failure occurred. In my day, you didn't, you didn't quite get that. It just escaped out and you didn't get, unless you trapped the exceptions and specifically wrote it to a log, you didn't get it. And all that stuff that's correct in Java is, is all very good, but you didn't used to get that in my day. So there's less need, but the same token, the Java messages, can be quite confusing. And one of the things I always did when I wrote code is if a function I wrote failed, I would then output what the variables are. And I don't think Java is quite clever enough to do that yet. Um, well, it may be, but I don't think it is. But that then helps you because then you go and say this function failed with this null and this date way in the future. Okay, well, yeah, it can't handle a null or it can't handle this type of date. So you then can read, because as I mentioned, slightly with uh, the, the doubling and stuff using parameters. If you quite closely use parameters, you know what the function, you can then very closely test it. It only gets these parameters and gives this return value. And therefore, if you do that, you also, if you have, if you do catch exceptions and you output what the values are that you passed in, it's a lot easier to reproduce that error and know why it, it happened. So, also, not, having commented out code is not good. So when you're refactoring, remove the commented out code. That's what your version history is for. Your version history means people can put a comment and if they've removed a section of code, you can go back to the version history from your repository and then re-get it. So don't have commented out code. Make sure you comment it well in your version history when you're submitting off. Remove this functionality because it's no one's using it yet and it's just taking up space. So I removed it because people are not then getting confused by it. Brilliant. If someone wants to re-add it, they can look through the version history and then re-add it. Yeah. And it's important to make use of that version history because it can be of quite good value. And then the point is how you just got to consider how readable your code is and you want it to be nice and easy to reread. And that's the point, as I mentioned earlier on, if you get nice little methods that do individual things, it becomes easy to understand what you do. So then your organizer methods that call four or five methods are, are almost just like English to read. So also one thing just for you for how you to improve is reading and writing will help. So therefore, by you doing code reviews, um, of other people's code, you'll see styles, you'll start to understand good variable names, etc. That will all help you. So potentially ask your coach to point you to some well-written code and ask if you can be involved in the code review. The code review might still need to be done by a senior developer, but you can have multiple reviewers, in which case by you reviewing other people's code, you, that will help you learn. And likewise, just the more code you write and the code reviews that happen on your code will all help you learn to make sure that you can start improving writing cleaner code and better refactored. Um, and make sure the code you write, especially while you're starting out, even if your company doesn't do it, ask your coaches, could you go and put your pull requests in to be reviewed? It may not be the standard practice, especially as you're starting out. And maybe, so in my day, we didn't really do things as so much as code review, but as a team lead, what you would do is, as someone started out, you'd probably review all their code, and then it'd be a little bit more random, maybe once a week, once a month, once they got more established. But you still reviewed code, but it wasn't quite as formal as some people do in terms of the pull request. But you still made sure that there was a high quality of code um, going into things. 
So hopefully you can see this just now, but just an example of refactored code. So my main is um, calculate age, get date from, and then date. So the point is the get date from DDMMYY, just by call, I don't need to look in to get date to understand how to call it because it's in the method name. So it's nice and easy. And then my calculate age takes in a date of birth and then it's doing between, so one could have written that as one function, but calculate age now is calculate age. Whereas period between date and date, get years. That's quite long um, to try and read and does take a little bit of thinking power to try and understand it. Whereas calculate age just tells you on the nose what it does, okay? So I'll now just cover a bit in terms of uh, testing. So you wanna try and catch your errors early. And the reason for testing is really for preventing, um, you want to try and prevent production failures, okay? And you don't want to want it to break for the customer and you want to make it maintainable. And by having the regression testing means someone can change something quickly. If they are changing something and they're not so familiar with the code, they could potentially break something that already works. Whereas by you creating your automated unit tests ensures that the code you've created will be maintained and continue to work because you've created those unit tests. And I used to take quite a bit of pride about what I um, created as I initially was um, being a software engineer, a developer. But by creating these regression tests, you can ensure that you're putting the time and effort to make sure this great creation, this work, well working thing you've created will continue to work, work well. And fixes uh, don't break what's already uh, working. You want to make sure that when you're doing your little hot fixes, this, that, another, and you're trying to do that quickly because you're under pressure because the business isn't working, you want to be able to make that change quickly and you don't, you want to avoid breaking anything else. So for example, um, which is about a year ago or something like that, but Boeing 737 Max is crashed and people died and they end up having to take their, all those planes down and they were, um, weren't able to fly. So it cost Boeing a lot of money, a lot of reputational risk and significant amount of cost. And the point is that was down to a coding error. They hadn't tested it properly. So in which case, because they hadn't tested it properly, an issue happened and people died. It might not be quite the same in terms of a, a bank, but with the same token, if Barclays goes under, then some pension fund uh, probably is invested in Barclays and it shows, so you make a mistake, Barclays then ends up having reputational risk, people start leaving the bank, then pension funds have invested in Barclays, people then could be committing suicide because uh, they, they don't have enough to live off from their pension. So the, my point is that it is quite important that you do test and don't make mistakes because if, if you did make a mistake that suddenly um, people are getting less money than you should be because you're not rounding your interest rate calculation for Barclays correctly, that will cause a lot of reputational risk and people will leave. So you've got to be very, it's very important that you do test and test well. Um, testing is the act of creating, executing and maintaining tests. Um, the purpose of a test is to A, prevent the introduction of defects and demonstrate the implication confirms to the requirements and documents typical use cases. And that's the thing about test coverage versus test cases. You want to try and make sure that you're doing it. And the other point is also the argument against um, comments is if you're creating a lot of good unit tests, you in reality are commenting your code because you're seeing how it should be used and how it works. And those tests help you do that. So there's a standard process, which is the AE sort of testing process, which is first you arrange, then you act, and then you assert. And that more suggests that you do one thing at a time. You arrange your variables, you do an action of some sort, and then you assert. So today, or in this lecture rather, we've covered clean code, refactoring, testing, okay? So just in terms of repeating, there is pre-reading, a programming habit should adopt, hopefully you can read it in about five minutes, 
and then it's recommended you do the pre-reading um, quiz. And then optionally, there's a few things. So there's Robert Martin, who's referred to as Uncle Bob's Clean Code. Um, and there's also the tips on writing clean code. Both of these, I think, will be um, quite useful. And then just to go through the references, as I mentioned, these are just a number of different papers um, that are citing things about um, working memory, et cetera. And they are hopefully of, of some use. Okay, well, um, thank you um, very much and um, speak to you soon.